Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to Test Those Breasts. I am Jamie Vaughn, your host. Today, my guest is Natalie Stevenson. Natalie is a co-founder of Cancer Community Clubhouse and a metastatic breast cancer survivor. With over 17 years of experience working with real estate investors and a leading financial security company as an investment and retirement specialist, Natalie has returned to her roots in human services. Natalie holds a bachelor's degree in human and family sciences, serves on the Nevada Cancer Coalition Survivorship Task Force, is a 2022 Elevate Ambassador for the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, and a mentor angel with Emmerman Angels. Originally diagnosed as a young single mother, Natalie especially values and enjoys spending time with her son, practicing mindfulness techniques, including meditation, yoga, and qigong, and she escapes to the natural retreats the region has to offer, especially Lake Tahoe. As a survivor, she is committed to helping others find a renewed sense of happiness despite going through cancer as a life event. Above all, she aims to create a space for connection so that others do not have to go through the journey alone. Well, welcome, Natalie. It's so great to have you on this episode of Test Those Breasts. You are pretty well known around our area, so I've seen your name here and there, and I'm so glad that we were able to connect. And thank you for being here. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here with you, Jamie. Good. Well, I just want to just jump right into all of this great information that we can get out to our audience. And I just want to start off by asking you about your cancer journey. I know that it's pretty complex. And so if we could just start there and then we'll kind of go into what it is that you do for our community. Sure. Yeah. So I've been in the cancer world for about 10 years. I've been in cancer treatment. And 10 years ago, if you had told me that I would 10 years later still be in cancer treatment, I wouldn't have been able to hang in there. But 10 years ago, as a 34-year-old single mother, my son was in fourth grade. I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. And so I will tell you that I found a lump in my breast actually when I was 32. And I went in and the radiology at the time could not see the lung that I felt. And so they told me, well, you're pretty young. It's probably just a cyst. Maybe it's coming and going according to your cycle. And if it changes, come back and let us know. And so I go on. Well, of course, the whole time I can feel the lump. And so I'm not feeling like anything is changing. But fast forward two years. I had a one and a half inch tumor in my breast. It was so deep against my chest wall. And that's why they couldn't see it with that imaging. So here I am, 34 years old. Man, had that imaging been good enough to catch it two years earlier, it would have been stage one, stage zero, and probably would have been fine. But it was a big tumor. By that point, it had spread into every single one of my lymph nodes. But thank goodness, it had not spread around my body at that point. And so they immediately got me in ACT chemo for five months, double mastectomy, radiation. I did a deep flap reconstruction, had my ovaries removed, went on the estrogen blocker, came back and did implants. So my treatments lasted for two years. And... The whole time I'm working full time in a stressful job. I was an investment manager. I'm a single mom. So I'm dropping my child off to school, picking him up, getting dinner, taking him to his activities while trying to manage what I didn't even realize at the time was going to be very intense side effects from all of these treatments that I had received. And when I finished treatment, I truly thought, I'm done with treatment, ring the bell, which technically I didn't take my last chemo, so I never got to ring the bell. They release you from treatment. And I just assumed I wasn't hearing of other young women who had had breast cancer. I wasn't connected with other people. And so my thinking about breast cancer was just that everybody was able to move on with their life. 
And here I was having all of these issues, physical issues, social relationship issues, because it just changes you, your body changes and you go through all of these difficult experiences. And I was no longer able to relate to other people my age. And so I, I was really socially cut off even talking to my oncologist saying, hey, do you have any therapists who can work with breast cancer patients? And no, we don't have anybody. There just was no additional support. So I went through a pretty rough four years, found myself going just down and down and down, hit rock bottom, decided to make some changes. I learned about mindfulness, meditation, things like that, that helped me, kind of leveled me up once. I got connected with a really great therapist that leveled me up. All of these tools that I later learned, the oncology world knows about. There is research that says this is how we can help survivors get through their survivorship. And I was kind of angry. Why did nobody share that with me, even though I was sharing with them how much I was struggling? And fast forward six years, the cancer did return. It was now in my phone. I am now stage four metastatic breast cancer, which we know there is no cure for. I will be in treatment the rest of my life. Part of the reason that I know that is because when I was really struggling after four years, I decided I can't take this estrogen blocker anymore. It's really causing me a lot of problems. And the doctor said, well, some women just can't tolerate this medication. And so I'm like, okay, I don't tolerate it. I'm getting off of it. Well, and two years later, the cancer started to grow around my body. I needed to stay on that estrogen blocker. So the cancer returns. I'm stage four. I try to work harder and harder because just like you, I'm going, where's my identity? How am I going to take care of my son who's now 16? How am I going to take care of me? You know, all these things. So I'm working, working, working. And finally, I realize I can't live with stage four cancer and continue to work in a very stressful environment. I need to choose me. Yes. And that is a difficult thing in our society. That is not a well accepted. <laughs> no, it is not <clears throat> in our society. So that's a little bit about the treatments I've been through and my experience. I did end up losing my career. I walked away from a career that I had built for many years. It brought me a lot of fulfillment, and that was very difficult to walk away from something like that. You think you're building a life in our society by moving up and moving on and taking care of financial things and all of this, and then to have one thing come and smack you down, it's just very defeating and discouraging. Well, that one thing is huge, and I don't know if you can see, but I'm pretty emotional about your story right now. I didn't know all of this about you until oh. just now. And I am crying a little bit right now. What a crazy experience you've had. And it is interesting because I have recently learned about so many other women who were around the same age that you were, who got cancer, who also had a very rough time because the resources didn't seem to present themselves to these other women either. And when you said that you were angry that you did not find out more about therapy and other things to do to help with your emotional well-being as well, I can understand that anger. I know that I would have been angry as well. And that is one of the biggest reasons I also started this podcast is to make sure that I bring to the audience these resources and also to be able to advocate for themselves. And it appears that you advocated as much as you possibly could with the knowledge that you had. So I'm so glad that you are here to tell the story. And I'm really glad that you're here to support other people around our community. And so with that, can you let us all know what it is you do for our community? Because I think it's very fascinating 
when I feel like that is your calling right now. You have a significance. You have an impact on our community. Thanks, Jamie. I will say that I found myself in a very interesting life situation. Having walked away from my career because I knew I couldn't take on that stress with this kind of a diagnosis, but also you feeling like I need to offer the world something. I can't just sit around and live a life that I need meaning. So when I was diagnosed stage four, I did decide to switch oncologists at that point because I was rather frustrated that I had reached out to my oncology team and I felt like I was left high and dry. To be clear, all of my treatment, original treatment, happened down in Dallas, Texas. So when I switched my oncologist and I'm diagnosed stage four, and of course I'm in her office just crying and crying and crying. How am I going to live? How am I going to get through this? And she said, Natalie, you have to go get connected with a cancer community that they had down in Dallas. And it was that one recommendation totally changed my life. I went into this community and it took courage. It was hard for me to walk in there knowing that I was probably on the younger end of the people that were going to these programs. I walked in there though, and what I found was finally this understanding. People where all these things were going on in my mind about what I'm thinking about the cancer, how I'm going to die, am I going to go through treatment, am I going to refuse treatment, what am I going to do? And all of these people who had been there, they were helping me negotiate all of these things in my mind and helping me bring the words and the vocabulary to what was going on inside of me. Because like I knew I had all this anxiety and stress and I could cry to people and tell people, but I still didn't understand all of it. And so in that community down in Dallas, they did have a stage four metastatic support group. And I started attending that. And some of those women had been living with metastatic breast cancer for several years in treatment and kind of gave me hope. Like, oh, now I understand. I'm going to start with this treatment and we're going to see how long it works. And hopefully it works for a long, long time. And if it does, that's best case scenario. But if it doesn't, then I'll go to the next treatment. And that's probably going to work for a while. And then when that stops, I'll go to the next treatment. And here I had women who had already walked those paths of flipping through treatments. And so they knew the treatment I was on. They knew the side effects I was having, all of those things. And they just helped me. One woman said, because I'm a driven person, I can tell you are too. And when you have drive like this, you just keep driving and driving. But what happened for me is I'm hitting wall after wall and it's discouraging. And she says, Natalie, stop trying to go all day long with your energy. That may be something of the past. Start resting from 1 to 3 p.m. every day. Rest. Take a nap, do whatever you need to do, recharge your body, stop trying to push through the way that you used to. And that one thing you yeah. would think is so obvious, like, oh, hey, I'm on treatment. It's okay for me to rest every day. But in my mind, it was not okay for me to rest every day. I had to be working. I had to be valuable. Yes. And society. that is what one of my therapists in Australia who I also interviewed that you'll be meeting soon. He told us it's because we're in the business of busyness. Yes. If we are not productive, we don't feel like we're doing something that we should be doing. And I have actually had to really rein that in because I was always busy doing, 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 doing social mm -hmm. stuff, work, everything. And so I now have in my mind it is okay to be productive, but also it is very much okay to just relax yeah, and breathe and take a nap and enjoy the sun and not be doing a million things. 
and find balance, right? My life was not balanced before cancer. It was not balanced, but I will tell you, it was forced into balance when I had this kind of diagnosis. So I find that community down in Texas and I finally, I'm going, I'm finally finding a stable place to rest and then decided, hey, if I can't work down here in Texas, I'm going to move back home to Reno. I was born and raised here. I do have family in both places, but my heart belongs to Tahoe. (laughs) And I thought, if I'm going to die, I'm going to go die up in Tahoe. And so my son graduated school early. He was accepted to UNR. He got a full ride scholarship in civil engineering at 16 years old. And I just thought, okay, this is meant to be. I need, we, we are meant to go be back in Reno. So sure enough, I made the move, came back to Reno, and I start trying to find resources. Okay, they're the therapists that can talk about cancer. Now I've had a year and a half worth of excellent therapy down in Dallas. Where can I get excellent therapy here? I came up empty. Now, remember, Jamie, I'm not connected in Reno. And so I'm asking the medical professionals. I'm asking the cancer centers, where can I get therapy? Well, we don't, we don't really have any therapists. There's no therapist. So I go and I'm trying to try these different therapists out to see about therapy. And I did finally get connected with somebody, which was great. But And then we've got some support groups, but it was nothing like the support that I felt in Dallas, the way that I felt held that any day of the week, if I was struggling, I could go down to that cancer community center and find support, whether it was a group, an art group, or a meditation group, or yoga, or a support group, or they have things for kids. They just had all of these different ways that, and I mentioned socially being so young and going through the body changes that I had been through, that cancer community became my social outlet also because these people understood what was happening with me. And so I come up here to Reno, I realize there's nothing like it up here, and I start to talk to other survivors and they're going man, that would be great if we had what you had in Texas, if we had that here. And so I thought, okay, so I kind of start getting connected with people and I'm hearing a lot of, no, we've tried to do that before and cancer survivors just aren't interested in these kinds of programs and nobody shows up if we hold something. There was all of this pushback. And I thought, okay, well, that's fine. People don't really want it. That would be okay. But I'm just going to try to do something just because I have the time. I'm in a unique situation. I'm young. I have 10 years of cancer experience. And I experienced an incredibly supportive cancer community that I came from. And I knew how it ran. And so I thought, and, I, and here I am, not working. <laughs> I've lost my income. So how do I hopefully help some people? But at the same time, I needed help and support. And I wanted that community. I wanted the strength and support. So I grabbed my sister and we start talking about this idea of creating a cancer community. And we start just plugging away. In our part-time, free-time hours, we're plugging away. And now, two and a half years later, we have built the Cancer Community Clubhouse is the name of the nonprofit organization. We are a cancer survivorship organization. So as of now, we don't have a community center that is our own dedicated place, but that is our goal. We need a cancer community center. I call it a clubhouse because that's what it was called in Dallas, but I like it. Yes, we need a place that isn't associated. You know, we have five different cancer centers around here, and each one might have different resources, but they're not interchangeable between the whole community. 
We need a place that the entire community can come, no matter what type of cancer they were diagnosed with. Anybody can come. Survivors, family members, we have support people who come to our groups. Really, any people who have lost a parent to cancer or just lost someone to cancer, they all come for the additional support. So building the community is one thing. We have really great groups. We have an art group that we do once a month. We do a coffee connection. We have a lunch and learn. We have a metastatic peer-to-peer group, which is important. There are no metastatic groups around here. So that's important that the people who will be living with cancer for the rest of their lives, that they have people who understand what that experience is about. And we do a mindfulness group. Right now, it's a sound bath. We have a gentleman who does incredible sound baths. They're excellent. So we do each of those programs, but we need to go further and do more. We need mental health care for every survivor that lives anywhere, but specifically the people around us, right? They need mental health care. And we now have a couple of therapists, and I'm excited to add your therapist to our list because each therapist might take different insurance or whatever, so that's tricky. But we need a community center, we need mental health care, and we need to be able to make sure that every survivor, from the moment they are diagnosed, so we are a survivor from the minute that we hear those words, you have cancer, that makes us a survivor from that moment. And we need support. We need our clinicians to be connecting survivors with these supportive resources from that very day of diagnosis. Don't wait until the survivor has gone through hell and and then go, oh, you're not looking real good. Let's get you connected. No, connect people now before that happens. And your story versus my story, that is the testimony to that. Jamie got connected with a therapist immediately. And look, you're transforming your survivorship experience right now. And here's Natalie who struggled, struggled, struggled alone, struggled alone. You know what I mean? Ask for help. No help was offered and struggle, struggle, struggle until I'm at the rock bottom. My poor son lived with his mom. His whole life was mom in cancer care. Even when we moved back to Reno, his rock, his person is now facing death and treatment and not looking good. And he sees his mom sleeping all the time. You know what I mean? My son needs access to mental health. The people around us need some sort of bridge. Okay, so I've not ever been married or had a partner around. But if I had, that partner needs support and therapy on their own. Because they're dealing with different types of things than the person living in the body of what's happening is one situation. And the person who is trying to be supportive, they have their other perception and interpretation of this experience, right? And sometimes those can conflict. It can be the survivor going, I just can't possibly get off the couch. And the support person going, Come on, get off the couch. I know what's good for you. Go sit out in the sun. Go for a walk. Get off the couch. But the survivor's like, whoa, wait a second. You've got to listen to me and my body. And my body doesn't do what my body used to do. So it's a new set of circumstances. It's a new set of living a new life. And how do we do that? We need support and community and mental health and social relationships. That's how we do it. There is a recipe for getting out of this cancer experience. And I won't say getting out of it, but coping better Mm -hmm. with the experience. And when you can do that, all of a sudden the rays of joy and happiness 
start coming into the picture where you thought there was only this dark hole of defeat. And then the joy and happiness starts to trickle in. And the more it trickles in, the more you learn to what I call it is live in both worlds. I can live in the world of laughing and joy and happiness. And at the exact same time, I can live in a world where I've lost an important career and I've lost some friendships around me and I've lost my daily life and what made me me previously. But I can integrate those two things and actually live a very well-rounded, balanced life. But I have to learn how to oscillate easily between the joy and the pain on a daily basis rather than getting stuck in the pain or getting stuck in the suffering. Let's transform suffering and figure out how to hold suffering because it exists Mm -hmm. and also how to hold the other sides that also exist, the joy and the happiness that we can still make as part of our lives as survivors. Yeah, boy, you have summed up so much of what has been going on with me this whole entire year. And I know that not everyone has the wherewithal or the just the understanding that they need to get themselves plugged in. But when you have like islands of organizations that are not interconnected, it is very difficult. I realized that everything was sort of separated in our community. And I did not get that advice from my oncologist or any of the medical professionals to go to therapy or to seek out mindfulness or whatever. I just reached out myself. I knew that I needed a therapist. I had a therapist for after when my mom died back in 2019. I knew that I needed someone who had experience with cancer patients. And that is how I was connected to Terry Ann through a friend of mine. And so I was lucky to have found her. And again, I'm still with her to this day. I see her every week or two because we are on a continued healing journey. It's not over. I'm very different. I'm Jamie at the core from before cancer, but I'm just a different person. And so I am so glad that I got to talk to you because I feel like you understand that those bridges need to be made. And also that information needs to be coming from our medical professionals. We should not be needing to ask, hey, what kind of support is out there? Those medical professionals should be plugging us in right away and they should have that knowledge. So thank you for working on that. I feel like I need to be part of this. Yes. And I know that I am (laughs) only because, well, from this baby podcast stage, I know that one of the reasons I started this podcast is because I knew that I had to tumble through and figure out the resources out there because it is so gosh darn overwhelming. It's so overwhelming that I didn't even really want to deal with it because I was already feeling horrible in my head. I wasn't feeling well. I had a husband who I'm usually throwing resources at because he's sort of the black and white type guy. Oh, we're going to get this done. Everything's going to be okay. I'm going to take you to your doctor's appointments and all this stuff. But he wasn't really thinking about the mental health stuff. I was. And I knew that he was going to also need that support. So I'm the one that did the research and threw it towards him. And we just need someone like this podcast is really what I envisioned it to be is to help people understand that there are people out there who want to help and I want to give them those resources and so that they can get plugged in right away. So, yes, I feel like I need to be more part of this, too. Yeah. And how cool if we can create, it takes a lot of people working together to create this community, cancer community center, like we're talking about, but how cool for a doctor to be able to go, look, I'm trying to get rid of the cancer in your body, but that's what I've been trained to do is to attack and kill that cancer. I'm not a trained mental health therapist, but 
if they can say, here's what I do, but for all the other stuff, for your physical rehab, not physical therapy, but actual like exercise, cancer rehab exercise, here's where you can go. If they have a cancer community center that they know the patients are in good hands, just go over there. And at that community center, you're going to find other survivors with your similar cancer. You're going to find resources. I know that there are places that have resources in the community, but like you said, if they're separated, then people don't know about them. And so one place where we can hold all of this kind of stuff. And so that is the vision. And that's the goal is to really be able to create that. And Jamie, I will tell you, here's the other thing. This is not a new idea to have these cancer community centers are in most of the major cities across the United States. Survivorship is not a new concept, but it is new in our area. And so that's the idea is let's take what's working in other areas and just mimic it here. And now our biggest little city will be just like all the big cities that have these resources all in one place for any. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, because obviously there are going to be other people listening to this outside of our own community and how they can find it. But it makes sense because I have found out in the last year how a bit behind the curve Reno has been for several things. One being for breast reconstruction, I ended up getting the deep flap surgery in New Orleans because they don't do that here. And I'm really hoping that Reno gets with the program and brings somebody in who knows how to do that and specializes in those kind of autologous type surgeries. So I'm just really glad that that we have a community that's building like that. So Natalie, I've heard you talk about advocacy and how important advocacy is. And I know that you are a major great advocate for others. Can you share with us a little bit about what your experience is in advocacy and what that looks like? Sure. Who would have thought 10 years ago that this would be the person showing up advocating for cancer survivorship. So when I moved to Reno and I started this nonprofit, I was connected with the Nevada Cancer Coalition. And come to find out, Nevada Cancer Coalition is working on improving quality of life for survivors in all of Nevada. And so they are pulling survivors and trying to figure out what survivors need to help them in their survivorship. And they're creating ways to bridge the gap between medical professionals and the survivors through trainings or really anything that survivors have in Nevada have said that they need. So I kind of think about advocacy on different levels. One is from a patient level. So you talk about meeting personally to advocate with your doctors and the things that impact you as a patient. So you're doing personal advocacy. Then we have an organization like a cancer community clubhouse that helps survivors in a local area. And then we move up the advocacy trail to the statewide level. And we have the Nevada Cancer Coalition that is doing research on survivors and then putting programs in place to really start to nail down and work on some of these situations that survivors are dealing with. And then we go to a national level. And this is where I just had no clue as a survivor. I just thought it was about me, like that I was the one that was having all of these issues. And I go to my medical professionals and it seemed like they acted like I was the only one having these issues. And then come to find out I'm not. And they are working on these on the local level, on the statewide level. And then you get to the national level. So the the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. They are working on the national level, trying to get things in place to support survivors. 
the way that we as a survivor can have a voice in all of these things is to participate in their annual surveys. So every year, National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, they do an enormous survey of survivors to really drill down to what survivors are experiencing. And out of that survey is how they compile information and take it to our legislators to say, hey, here's what we need. So it's interesting we had talked about the deep flap surgery. Did you know that within the last few months, they were getting ready to remove that code yes. for survivors? And that would have taken away our ability to have that kind of reconstruction. But because all these organizations came together on a national level, they advocated for that code not to be removed. And sure enough, it happened. But it happened for our benefit yes. because of a national organization that is working on these things. You can go to that website, canceradvocacy.org, and you can see their previous years of research. And you go and look through that research and you see 40% of cancer survivors up to 10 years later are still dealing with physical side effects, mm -hmm. mental health side effects. And I'm thinking, hello, this should be obvious because to me, it's my lived experience. But to the practitioners, it's not obvious. And that's where we advocate. We use our voice to help them understand, I am not the only one going through this. There is a group of us going through this. And using our voices can actually advocate for the future survivors. I'm okay. hoping that in 10 years, nobody ever goes through what I went through in my survivorship we've got to have more support. And that's how it's working. It works on the local level, the statewide level, and then the national level. And we can get involved in any of those levels that we feel good about. We can get involved and use our time to help the future generation. That's such great information because there's such a myth out there that once we're cancer-free, we are all good to go and we move forward and everything gets back to normal. And that's just not how it works. And I really do think there are a lot of people out there who in their mind, in their survivorship mind, and, and that they just need to pick up and get going in life. And which is true. You want to keep going in life. But because of the pressures that they get for getting back to normal, that it keeps them at bay from getting involved and really understanding that they're not the only person who's feeling this way. And yes, I did hear about that code and I happened to be on an advocacy group to push that through to CMS to have that meeting on June 1st. And it was Dr. Elizabeth Potter who really spearheaded a huge part of that. And I was so happy to find out about it because I literally had just gotten my deep flap surgery and found out about it right after that. And I was just horrified that I almost wasn't able to get that. That survey that you were talking about, does that come via email, mail? How do we know when it's going to be coming around? Yeah, so you'll need to go on. If you want to get connected on the national level for that survey, you can find the previous year surveys. They just closed this year's survey at the end of June. But go sign up. Just enter your email address at canceradvocacy.org. Okay. That's how you can get that survey. That one they do when they're getting ready to do the survey. They email everybody in their email list. Hey, the survey's available. We put it out locally to our cancer community via our newsletter. So to be able to have your voice heard through that survey is a really big deal. Also with the Nevada Cancer Coalition, they do surveys. Okay. I believe theirs is maybe once every three years that they do their survivorship survey. And I'm not sure that I've actually done one with Nevada Cancer Coalition yet. So we might be coming on another one coming up. But their NevadaCancerCoalition.org slash ThriveNV. ThriveNV is the website that they've created for survivors to connect them with 
resources statewide. And then also to be able to start building this database of survivors that want to be connected in some kind of way. So I would guess that that survey is going to come out. Great. Yeah, I, and Carrie Harrington did talk about the Thrive. And so I need to go on yeah. there and put my name in there because I didn't even know about that really until you just said that we need to get in there and put our email address. And then, of course, share it on social media if you are a survivor and you want to be part of the conversation and decision making to go to that website. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us about advocacy. And my next question, is the cancer journey ever finished? Yeah. The way that I think about that is that each of us, first of all, our cancer journeys are very different. Even though we might get a similar treatment, we all have very different cancer journeys. And one thing that I learned about myself, being so young, being a single mom, working full time in a pretty stressful career, these things were all a risk factor. So I had several risk factors, including the lengths of my treatment. I was in treatment a lot longer than tip the typical breast cancer patient. And so depending on what kind of risk factors you have for having a more difficult time in your survivorship. So they know that there are risk factors. And I do see people all the time that go, oh yeah, I had cancer, but I just had a breast surgery and nothing's ever happened. And honestly, it feels like I never even had cancer. And I think, man, I wish that was me, <laughs> first of all. And second of all, I think, man, that's really awesome that they were able to get rid of your cancer and that it didn't become something that was so pervasive in your life. And so I do think that people like that exist and that's totally okay. I know that if I had not been through everything I'd been through, even after I had been through two years of treatment, I had this attitude like, no, I'm done with cancer. I'm turning my back on cancer. I didn't know that I needed the support in the way that I did. I knew I needed mental health care, but I didn't know that I needed the community of people. And so I guess that's my thinking about there's this whole spectrum of our experiences when we go through cancer. And it can be everything from it barely impacted me to, yeah. Like I'm having trouble staying on the estrogen blocker, but in general, I feel supported. And then down here on this other end, we've got single women, young women, women who are brand new moms that are going through all these kinds of things. And all of those things are risk factors and they do need the community around them. Whether they come in once a month, for Survivor's Day. So we do an annual celebration called Survivor's Day. It's National Cancer Survivor's Day. It's the first Sunday of every June, and we throw a big celebration. And so we see, I see survivors that don't feel like they need the support on a weekly or monthly basis, but they come to Survivor's Day and they see all their friends and they listen to some cool speakers and just get refilled with energy. And that's awesome. And then we also have people who are caregiving to somebody they've been married to for 40 years who is terminal. And how do they cope with that? And how deeply does that affect spirituality? And like we've talked about identity, who are you with the idea that this person is dying? Death and dying. That too. I didn't even know that. There are deaf doulas that can help come help people figure out end of life. And even if you're not actively dying, just to get a new perspective on that. And so I do think that each person is an individual in what they can tolerate with that word cancer and then also what their experience is how in tune they are with themselves. I say when people show up to our programs, they are showing up for themselves because I know the transformation that happens with the people who show up. They're showing up for themselves and it is transforming their survivorship experiences. That is very impactful. 
So Natalie, is there a calendar? What kind of resources do you have for us for people to contact you or look at a calendar of events? Sure. Our website is www.cancercommunityclubhouse.org. And on there, you'll find all of the information about why we started. You'll find my bio, my cancer story, and then also a calendar of events. We are open to anybody who has been affected by cancer who lives anywhere in northern Nevada. And it's any cancer. It doesn't just have to be breast. It's any cancer. They can come and participate in the programs. All of our programs are offered free of charge because we know that people who have gone through cancer have taken on extra medical expenses, not working, all of those things. So it's really important to us that we are able to offer all of this for free to our community. And we are able to do that because we have an incredible community around us that believes in this idea of supporting cancer survivors. And they gift money financially for us to be able to put together these programs. Excellent. And then, like I said, yeah, we'll be doing a capital com campaign coming up in the next year or two to really fund the Cancer Community Clubhouse so that it can be an ongoing permanent thing. Even if in the next, you know, we never know what my situation is going to be. It could change overnight. And what I want is for there to be something that is here that can stay here and be accessible to everybody. And so right. that's what we're shooting for. And enough people involved to be able to carry that torch. Yep. What an excellent idea. Well, I am going to make sure that I get this episode out to as many people as I can so that they have an understanding of what is available in our community. And for other people outside of our community to make sure that they're looking at their own communities too, to find yeah. out more about. Jamie, can I say two other things? Find us on Facebook and Instagram, Cancer Community Clubhouse. We post up our upcoming events and things like that. So that's a great way to stay informed. And then I wanted to mention the two other organizations really quickly that I had found because you had mentioned that you might have people from across the U.S. The Cancer Support Community is the one that I was a part of in Dallas. They have affiliates all across the United States. And then the other one is the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. They are working on legislation to help survivors get through these things. And again, survivors from the moment of diagnosis. So it includes patients. But those are incredible resources that are available nationwide. Wonderful. And we'll put those in the show notes as well so that everybody has a visual on that. I am just so grateful that we have gotten to spend this time together today. And I will be reaching out to you because we need to go have some coffee or something yes. and talk about. I want to hear more about this organization. I never even was part of it. I didn't even know it existed, actually, until a couple of my other breast cancer buddies told me about it. And so thank you for all that you do. Thank you for sharing your story. Thanks for making me cry. You have a very inspirational story. And obviously, you've got the drive to do with what you're doing because of that. And I believe personally that when we do things like this, it helps with our own mental and emotional well-being as well. So Yes. Thank you for that. For sure. And to my audience, thank you for joining. And I will see you next time on Test Those Breasts. 